Personally, I'm a good case for how easy it is to take reading for granted. I was involved in learning-related work for about seven or eight years, um, studying how children learn and how organizations and systems learn. And, um, and I never gave a thought to reading. I was looking at learning. I was looking at things that I would later call the health of learning and unhealthy learning and artificial learning, and I was studying all of that very passionately. But I just skipped over reading. And it wasn't until my own children kind of woke me up to it that I began to see reading in a new way. First, my son. Uh, this was back in 1990. He was at the time five years old. And his kindergarten teacher said he had the vocabulary of a 20-year-old. I mean, he was off-scale, verbally dexterous. Um, <clears throat> and he had learned to read it by himself in the sense that he was constantly playing computer games and video games and having to read things in order to do that. But nobody had ever systematically attempted to get him to read or to read a book or anything of that kind until he went to school. And when he went to school, I'll never forget, he comes home one day with a book in his hands, and he points, he takes his finger and he points at the words on this book, and he looks at me and he says, it can't be like that. It can't be like that. How could it be like that? I mean, he's used to um, computers and video games where he could trust the fact that even though I may not understand it right now, if he worked at it, there'd be a point at which it would snap clear. He'd understand it. He could progress from there. And yet, there was no way to conduct him into an understanding that would make this code transparent. And he was just blown away. How could it be such a mess? How could it be so confusing? And for me, I had never given it a second thought until, because of the nature of our relationship, I was able to track inside of his mind, follow what he was experiencing. He was able to communicate to me the kind of confusion that a bright, verbally sharp, powerful mind, young mind, was having as they encountered this code and tried to automatize it. Well, it turns out that I was able to come up with something that maybe I'll share parts of later on in the series that helped him just blast right through this. And so though I wrote a paper about this at the time, this is 1991, I completely kind of moved on back to my general work on learning and didn't think much of it again. Until about 10 years later, my daughter comes along. And she's got, by the time she's four years old, we recognize that she's got some kind of a problem, and both with some delay in speech and um, an inability to remember people's names and other things. So we go in and have her diagnosed, and it turns out she has what's called an auditory memory processing deficit. And the main consequence of that with reading has to do with she'll be reading along, hit a word that she's unfamiliar with, and she'll have to work it out, right? just like my son did. Um, <clears throat> but the difference is, is that after she works it out, she'll move on and encounter that same word a sentence later and have to do it all over again. So she not only had to deal with the confusion, she had to deal with a memory issue with respect to the sound processing that's down deep in the reading. And the consequence of this was, over time, a kind of um, fr a frustration level root rose in her and no matter what I did to try to contextualize this differently at the time, she kept, because of what was going on in school, the kind of stuff that was happening in the classroom for her, she kept sinking into this deep despair, this kind of shame. Like she felt there was something wrong with her because she couldn't do this well. As I watched my daughter sink into this despair and into this shame, I became panicked. I became really concerned. I mean, unlike my son, who was able to kind of conduct into a, a rate of processing, a, a way to deal with the ambiguity that he experienced in the code, with my daughter, because of this memory problem, she just kept slamming up against the wall, right? And, and as she did, with the, again, with the classroom and the students and, you know, the kind of general pressure that's on little children at the, during the time they were learning to read, she just started wilting inside, and, and it, it really, really scared me, really, really kind of woke me up to uh, what I would later call mind shame and how critical reading is in terms of shaping the way children emotionally relate to their minds. Hmm. And the more that, that, that my daughter exhibited this, the more that it dawned on me how general this is, how many people's lives are being affected by this very same thing that my daughter is revealing to me. 
as that as she, as she started to drop into the shame, and it's I started to see it color her life in so many ways. It was there at that point in time that I realized that in addition to the cognitive confusion involved here, there's an emotional consequence, an emotional consequence that's incredibly dangerous for children. And that's what caused the, the ignition of the Children of the Code Project when I committed to doing everything I could to create resources and to create change that would affect both those dimensions. I'm not about advocating any particular solutions, methodologies, or products. But back at the time that my son was struggling with this, I developed a way to cue him through the confusion. And it worked so well for him that he just blew right through it. And ultimately, it's what helped my daughter learn to read. I didn't want to get bogged down into it. I didn't want to make a product out of it. I wanted to communicate it to other folks that could do something with it. And so I wrote up a white paper, so to speak, on the idea, which I called Training Wheels. <clears throat> and I sent it out. I sent out a thousand copies of it and, you know, by email. And I heard back from Marvin Minsky, you know, the head of the AI lab at MIT and the head of the artificial intelligence lab and the media lab at MIT, uh, who said, this is a great idea, we should do this. I heard back from linguists in England, right, who would study the alphabet and how it works in the mind and, you know, how, how it evolved and all this kind of stuff. And said, this is a great idea, we should do this. I heard from a linguist at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Oh, yeah, this is a good idea, we should do this, right? Didn't hear back from, on and on and on. I heard back from kind of thinkers who came back and said, yeah, this really gets at it. But I didn't hear back from any educators. And whenever I have a conversation with educators about this, I mean, it was like it was, I was talking as if I was talking in Martian or something, right? They just couldn't track with it. So it occurred to me at that point in time that advocating solutions to problems that people don't understand actually retards the process of getting to solutions. And so that rather than trying to commercialize or give away or otherwise institutionalize some kind of fix for this, I realized that the real thing that's retarding this is that it's the entire space, what, from politics and business, there's products, there's methodologies, there's ideologies, there's gurus, and they're all in this paralyzing, mind-numbing war of sorts that's going on in education about how to teach reading. And that coming in with another thing to advocate about how to teach reading is just one more thing going on in that mess. And so in a real sense, the Children of the Code is a kind of departure from that that says, look, no matter what of those systems you want to use, no matter what system you believe in, the deeper you understand these challenges, the more that you understand what's at stake, the more that you understand what's involved, right? The better you can use whatever system you're using and differentially apply it to unfolding a path that will help people learn to read better.